This may be the best Joy Boy theory I've ever come across, so I have to share it. Credits go to a longtime Joy Fleet member, Mr. Bushido. Mr. Bushido, who has posted this epic theory on our Joy Fleet Discord and has been kind enough to allow me to share it with you all. I'll post the link to the Joy Fleet Discord down below if you want to read it for yourself or if you just want to have fun with the rest of the Joy Fleet. But I also wanted to discuss some of my own thoughts on this theory and on his ideas, so let's get straight down into it. So the basic premise of Mr. Bushido's theory is that Joy Boy is actually from Wano, and he also spent time living with the Minx. And in order to explain this, Mr. Bushido presents Gaimon as key to understanding Joy Boy and the One Piece itself. And Gaimon's story was that he spent years and years waiting and trying to claim this treasure that was far beyond his reach. And when Luffy retrieved that treasure box for him, it ended up that that treasure chest was empty anyways. But then by the end of his story, Gaimon realized that his treasure, his true treasure, was actually the really unique crossbred animals of his island. And Mr. Bushido explains that this story is actually an analogy for Joy Boy. More specifically, Joy Boy is like Gaimon, and the unique animals that are on his island are like the minks, and that Imu will also be a part of this story as someone who was close to Joy Boy and betrayed him. Now I'm gonna stop here because the Imu connection and that idea about the betrayal, that will sort of come down later in the theory, so hold on to that. But for now, I do love the idea about Gaimon being so more central and being so important to the overall story. The introduction of this weird little character may have seemed quite strange and unrelated to the overarching series. It definitely felt like an odd little side piece that Oda included in the early days of the series. A fun little tale that was born from his early writing that reflected much of the simpler, more grounded lessons that he was trying to show throughout his story. But I think it is actually definitely possible that this story has always meant more to the overarching story of One Piece. As Mr. Bushido also notes, it is true that Oda once did say that Gaimon is actually his favorite character, although I think Oda's answer to that question has changed throughout the years. But nevertheless, this could have been because in Oda's mind, Gaimon's story has always been supposed to be more reflective of the story of One Piece itself. Just told in a minuscule, in a condensed manner very early on in the series. A simple analogy that seems to be disconnected from the overall plot, but in reality, a very important metaphorical representation. Particularly back when Oda didn't realize One Piece was going to be as long as it has turned out to be. There's a reason why he inserted this seemingly unrelated, almost filler-like story right at the beginning of the series to tell an important lesson. And like I said, Gaimon's importance to this theory will get further developed as we go on, so let's keep going with the theory itself. But before we do, I'd really appreciate it if you would subscribe to this channel. I love discussing One Piece and I love hearing everyone's thoughts as well as sharing my own ideas. And the more people that we can reach with this channel to spread the good news of One Piece, then the world becomes a better place. So help me get this channel to 100k subscribers and I'd be eternally grateful. Like I said, the main idea of this theory is that Joy Boy is from Wano. And more specifically, Joy Boy is a Kazuki clan member from Wano. And Mr. Bushido points to a lot of possible hints that may have suggested this throughout the series. And the first major clue that may point to the idea that Joy Boy is a Kazuki member could be found at Zo. So in the Zo arc, the home of the Minx, we were introduced to the Whale Tree, which housed one of the road poneglyphs. In fact, the first road poneglyph we ever came across. But alongside this very important artifact, we also saw the Kazuki Crest. And we were told of this long-held relationship between the Minx and the Kazuki clan, the fact there was a promise between these two tribes or between these two groups of people that they would come to each other's aid. And Mr. Bushido says that it's strange that this promise was made to this specific family hundreds of years ago. And that they also chose this location above the Rod Poneglyph to place the sigil of the Kazuki clan. This makes him believe that the Kazuki clan, the Kazuki family, was specifically important because the minks were indebted to 
to this family, and in particular, one particular man, and he claims that this man was Joy Boy. And we're gonna pause here for a bit, because I think this is actually a very important point. During the Zo and Wano arcs, we found out that the Kazuki clan were somehow acquainted with Joy Boy. It was revealed that the Kazuki clan were responsible for creating the Polniglyphs, which is of course the medium that's been used by Joy Boy to impart messages for the future. And during his travels with the Roger Pirates, after finding Laugh Tale and the One Piece, Odin found out that Wano was a previously open nation, had to close its borders, but needed to reopen its borders before the Joy Boy would return and reappear, suggesting there was a very important relationship between Joy Boy and Wano as well. But I think the popular assumption has been that Joy Boy and Wano were simply allies, that Joy Boy and the Kazuki clan were allies, very similar to Joy Boy's allegiance with Fishman Island, likely the Shandorians and possibly the Minx themselves. And I don't think many people thought that Joy Boy was actually a Kazuki clan member himself or that he was from Wano. But I think the point that Mr. Bushido makes about the loyalty of the Minx to the Kazuki clan is quite important. If the Kazuki were simply just one of the allies of Joy Boy, then it's more likely that the Minx would also just be an ally of of Joy Boy. So then why fly the Kazuki's flag? Or why mark themselves with the sigil of the Kazuki? Why have their crest at this very sacred location? Why not the crest of the ancient kingdom? Why not the Jolly Roger of Joy Boy himself? Unless that Kazuki crest is actually the emblem of Joy Boy. In that sense, it would make sense that the Mink tribe would champion this emblem of the Kazuki, because this same emblem represents Joy Boy. And now there are a lot of other compelling clues that Mr. Bushido presents, but before we get to those, I want to throw a spanner in the works, and I want to present a potential major contradiction. In chapter 1114, Vegapunk explicitly states that Joy Boy was from an impossibly advanced civilization. He was born to this civilization 900 years ago, and based on some other things we already know, we can basically surmise that this advanced civilization that Vegapunk is referring to is the Ancient Kingdom. So then this would actually suggest that the Ancient Kingdom is quite separate and distinct from Wano. Vegapunk doesn't say that he was born at Wano, he says that he was born to an impossibly advanced civilization, meaning that this suggests that Joy Boy can't be a Kazuki from Wano. But for the purposes of this theory, because like I said, there are other great points, I think we could counter my counter argument by saying that the sunken Wano could have been known as something different, could have been called something different back then. When explaining the history of Wano, how it flooded and they had to rebuild all those centuries ago, Kazuki Sukiyaki actually indeed called this sunken Wano a different Wano. And so it could be taken that the ancient kingdom civilization doesn't exist anymore because the present day Wano is the rebirth of that civilization, but they can sort of be considered as separate nations. Quite similar to how you would probably distinguish present-day Italy from the great civilization of ancient Rome. Despite the fact that Italy is at the epicenter of that great Roman Empire, Italy is where the capital city Rome was, and I would imagine that still today that there are probably some people in Italy who could possibly trace down their lineage to some ancient Romans, but you'd still consider them quite different. And knowing what we know about ancient kingdom, about the technology, we could also argue that Wano has pretty advanced advanced technology, or at least that Wano is home to peculiarly advanced or very important resources. Wano stands out from other islands because it's so rich in resources. It was, after all, called the country of gold in its past. We know it to be extremely rich of mineral resources. It's also the origin of the sea stones, which is very important when you think about devil fruits and how the devil fruits are likely to have been born out of the ancient kingdom. But this sea stone connection is actually very important to the theory, so let's go back to it, because the second clue is Toki. Toki was a woman who was alive during the Void Century era, who traveled through time using her devil fruit, and she has, since all those centuries ago, been looking for the land of Wano when we were introduced to her. But Mr. Bushido points out that Toki, despite having been searching for the land of Wano for centuries, puts a hold on that goal when she comes across Odin, 
who is, of course, a Kazuki clan member. We don't know much about Toki, but we know that she's from the Amatsuki family. And that's intriguing because based on what we know of the noble families of Wano, we have the Kazuki, the Shimotsuki, Uzuki, Fugetsu, and the Kurozumi. And all of these great houses of Wano have the kanji for moon in their names, except for Kurozumi, which instead has the kanji for black charcoal. And Amatsuki also has this same kanji for moon. And so Mr. Bushido states that this makes him believe that the Amatsuki were also from the land of Wano, and that the Amatsuki were actually the original house of the shogunate. According to Mr. Bushido, it's strange that Toki's goal was to make it back to Wano, meaning that she was of course outside of the country when her time travel adventures began. And he also thinks that it's strange that Kazuki were actually sea stone masons or stone masons because that's odd for a shogunate family. Stone masons suggest a working class profession. And we know that it was the Kazuki clan that created the poneglyphs were the only ones who were able to read it apart from the Oharas centuries later. And so this all suggests that the Kazuki weren't actually the original noble royal family. They weren't the original shogunate. Instead, according to this theory, the original shogunate of the former Wano country was the Amatsuki clan and Toki was the daughter of the former shogun who would later form the world government with the other 19 kingdoms. Meaning that Wano was one of these 20 kingdoms alongside Dressrosa and Arabasta. And to support this, Mr. Bushido points out Saint Venus Juro, whom fans have long speculated to be somehow tied to Wano because of his attire, the fact that he wields a blade, which has recently been suggested, may have been hinted to be one of the Kitetsu blades. And going further, Mr. Bushido says that Wano was part of this 20 kingdom cohort, but the Amatsuki clan was overthrown by the Kazuki clan, who then installed a new shogunate with their family as the ruler. Toki herself, however, was loyal to Wano, was loyal to the Kazuki, and was forced to leave, but then she escaped and tried to return to Wano ever since. So we're gonna stop here again because I am half sold at this point, but I think we have also missed a few major points. Most importantly, in chapter 965, the Amatsuki clan was actually stated to be one of the Damio clans. And the Amatsuki clan, alongside the other five noble houses of Wano, actually existed under the Kazuki shogunate family. So I'm not sure, I'm not convinced that it was the Amatsuki clan who was likely the former shogunate, and that the Amatsukis later went on to form the world government with the other 20 kingdoms. However, I am very much a fan of the idea that there was indeed another Wano family, a former ruling family who stood, who sat on the throne of Shogun at Wano, was the emperor possibly of Wano or of the former Wano before the Kazuki clan, and that this family went on to form the world government with the other kingdoms. And that this family is of course also the great family that Venus Juro comes from. And by the way, I actually have a video of my own where I discuss Venus Juro's Wano heritage. So feel free to watch that video after this one. I'll put the link for that down below as well. But let's get back to this theory. And according to the theory, if Gaimon represents Joy Boy, then Safunkul should represent Toki. And importantly, it seems that Oda may have placed some hints about the person that Safunkul would represent through her design. On her barrel, there are two clues. First is the word caution, the other is a star. So this word caution, according to Mr. Bushido, could suggest that Safanku represents something bad. It may serve as a warning, like she's not to be trusted. Whereas the star, that's a symbol of a celestial object. And that may have been a hint about the elder stars or of the celestial dragons, but Safunkul is supposed to represent this idea of someone close to Joy Boy who would betray him and form the world government alongside the other kingdoms. Now, because we've placed the Amatsuki and Toki portion of the theory aside, this could represent the other house of Wano, the one that Venus Juro comes from, because at the end of the day, Venus Juro is one of the Gorosei, he is an elder star, and someone whom we should treat with caution. Mr. Bushido also makes some connections to a real-life representation of Gaimon and Safunkul, the likely real-life inspiration behind these two characters, 
characters, the famous musical duo Simon and Garfunkel. So Simon and Garfunkel was a popular musical duo who dramatically broke up. Garfunkel believed that he was the more talented member of this duo, thought that he could make it out on his own, but after they split, he actually really struggled. He struggled to make a name for himself and he continued to live under the shadow, behind the shadow of the musical duo. Whereas Simon, Simon's career exploded. So I think Mr. Bushido points this out because this could potentially also suggest the treacherous nature of Safunkel, or I guess the treacherous nature of the person that Safunkel may represent. Because I don't think Safunkel herself is a dangerous, treacherous woman. She seems very sweet. She seems very much to care for Gaimon. Seems like a sweetheart, but I think you get the point. So another clue that we have is the poneglyph that was left at Fishman Island. Because this poneglyph, according to Mr. Bushido, is very unique. For one, it's the only one that has been left alongside another poneglyph. In all other cases, we've never seen that Joy Boy himself has left two poneglyphs side by side. And secondly, this poneglyph is very unique because it imparts a message to Fishman Island from Joy Boy himself. This one is Joy Boy's letter to the Fishman people. This makes it very distinct from the road poneglyphs, which are unique in their own rights because they point to the direction of laughter. But the other standard poneglyphs, they're usually supposed to detail aspects of the ancient history, they provide details about the ancient weapons, about the secrets of the world. But this poneglyph details an apology from Joy Boy to the people of Fishman Island. It reads like a handwritten letter from Joy Boy himself. And in fact, Mr. Bushido takes this to mean, or takes this to suggest, that the poneglyphs were indeed written by Joy Boy himself, because Joy Boy, as a Kazuki, was a stonemason, able to read, able to write, able to understand this mysterious script of the poneglyphs. Another great clue is in the popular pirate anthem, Bink Sake. Bink Sake is an important song that passes on the message of hope, and many fans do already believe that the lyrics actually have a much deeper, much more symbolic, more significant meaning that will tie in to the rest of the story and will likely point to the story of Joy Boy himself. So according to Mr. Bushido, the song tells the tale of a crew going out to deliver Bink Sake, only for that crew to face a great storm but to persevere through the struggle and find the sun again. And according to this theory, this story is the story of Joy Boy and his crew. Sake in Japan is a traditional drink used in ceremonies to establish bonds. We have seen this already through A Sabo and Luffy. And Mr. Bushido explains that this is also a metaphor for the poneglyphs because Joy Boy's crew escaped because of the help of Lily who spread the news, who spread the poneglyphs, sorry. Lily spread the poneglyphs to foreign islands for safekeeping and to unpack that idea a little bit. I think that what he's getting at is that just like how the sake ritual forms bonds, we know that Joy Boy has or it seems like Joy Boy has formed bonds with other nations and allies like the Ming tribe, the Shandorians or the Fishmen who are all provided with a poneglyph. This poneglyph, like the sake ritual, it establishes a tie between those groups. Mr. Bushido also points out how the song mentions sailing with birds circling the sky above them, and how this may actually be a metaphor for the Kazuki crest. Because at the center of the Kazuki crest, there is a bird, and this sigil of the Kazuki clan, that may have been the Jolly Roger that was flown over the ship that Joy Boy and his crew sailed on. Bing Sake also mentions Weaver's Town, Mr. Bushido interprets this to be a reference to the weaving of objects like straw hats and it just so happens that the first place that both Luffy and Ace landed in or ended up in Wano was Amigasa village or in English Amigasa can mean wickerwork straw hat village aka or IE, meaning the village that produces straw hats. Here, the theory goes on to also make a connection to Shimotsuki Kozaburo. So Kozaburo left Wano 55 years ago to the East Blue, and Mr. Bushido notes that coincidentally, Garp also joined the Marines 
55 years ago when he was at the age of 22. And seeing as Garp is Roger's rival, he thinks that Roger would have also started his journey 55 years ago. And we know that Roger had at least known of Wano even though he had never been there before. And given that Roger was from Logetown, also located in East Blue, it's possible that his sense of adventure and his desire to turn the world upside down, it seems that this drive was ignited around the same time a ship from Wano ended up in the East Blue. Now I did actually fact check and double cross all of these dates. And it is true that Kozaburo left Wano 55 years ago, but Garp actually joined the Marine 56 years ago and not 55 years ago. But it is still certainly possible that Roger came across the Shimotsuki ship who may have stopped at Logetown, may have passed by Logetown before they would eventually settle the Shimotsuki village. And this may actually be how Roger came to learn of Wano. It may have been how he received the straw had to start his own adventure. Because I actually discussed this very intriguing question of how Roger got his hand on the straw hat and this idea of the Shimotsuki village didn't actually cross my mind back then, but I am quite in love with this idea. And so then according to this theory, that would mean that when Luffy arrived at Wano when he returned with his straw hat, that straw hat would have essentially come full circle and returned to its original origin place. And so it's fitting that Luffy gave his hat for Otama to wear because Otama might have even been related to the person who gave the straw hat to Roger. Now it has been confirmed that Tama is from the Kurozumi clan, not the Shimotsuki, but we were also told that Shimotsuki Kuzaburo left with 22 other people from Wano and it didn't seem like all of them were necessarily from the Shimotsuki family. We know that Minamoto went with him, meaning that there may have been actually a Kurozumi clan member who was one of the people that Roger came across on this Shimotsuki ship. Anyways, Mr. Bushido also points to the giant straw hat at Marriage Wa, which could also be another hint. He points out that in the past, people have speculated that Joy Boy was a giant because of this giant straw hat, but that he has always argued that that hat is very big, but not quite big enough to fit a giant. In his words, too small for a giant, too big for a human, but perfect for something that happens to be a pretty big human. And here he's obviously referring to Odin, who is inextricably large. Now, I would personally have to say that even still, the straw hat at Marajoa seems way too big for Odin. But who knows, maybe Joy Boy, Odin's forefather, he may have been even larger than Odin. A human who wasn't a giant, but for some unexplained reason, very, very large. The next part of the theory? Zunesha. Zunesha is said to have been Joy Boy's Nakama, but Zunesha has been given an order to carry Zo on its back, always wander the seas, unable to make its own decision, waiting for someone to make orders that it can follow. Even when we saw it being attacked by Jack, Zunesha couldn't fight back of its own accord and didn't stop walking. Even when Luffy told Zunesha to fight back, Zunesha ignored him. And Zunesha replied that it could only follow the orders of Momonosuke. And it ended up that Momonosuke was the only person who was able to give Zunesha the orders to fight back. And this has always been a mystery for us. Why did he only respond to Momonosuke? Whereas now, this could actually make sense because Momonosuke would be the heir of Joy Boy. He's the heir of the Kazuki family. He carries Joy Boy's will. He's a descendant of Joy Boy. Momonosuke is the descendant of Zunesha's original captain. And I have previously seen that a lot of people think that Momonosuke may have been able to order Zunesha because he's similar to Shirohoshi. Momonosuke is also an ancient weapon. The most cited one is Pluton. And I have to say that I have never really liked that theory or subscribed to that theory just because of what we know of Pluton to be most likely a battleship, something that can be made something that can be created because there's a blueprint. So I much prefer this idea that Zunesha would actually listen to Momonosuke because Momonosuke is the descendant of his former Nakama, is the descendant of his former captain. Another hint that Mr. Bushido mentions is how Kaido seems to be obsessed with Joy Boy. Kaido states that Wano is special, that it's because it is Wano that he can't leave. And some, like Mr. Bushido, has taken this to mean that he chose Wano specifically as its base because of its connection to Joy Boy, because of its connection to ancient weapons, its connection to the Void Century. And now I'm not actually going to dive into this part of the theory because I think that deserves its own discussion about what Kaido meant when he said those things. 
and I think that deserves its own video. So for the purposes of today's discussion, let's just keep unpacking the theory. Because Mr. Bushido believes that Joy Boy left Wano, traveled around the world where he met the minks, fell in love with their culture and their way of life. Especially given the very honorable nature of the minks who love freely and would be willing to sacrifice their own lives to protect those that they have a connection with. And this is where Gaimon's connection and his relationship to the unique animals of the island becomes relevant again. Just like Gaimon, Joy Boy lived alongside the minks. And we may have actually seen this in chapter 1122 where we saw Joy Boy sitting on top of this large block that was almost tall, a similar height to Emmett. And that panel has already been recognized by many of us that it may have taken place at Zo because we know of the watchtowers at Zo that surround the perimeter and that seems to be where Mr. Bushido is going. So according to the theory, Joy Boy lived alongside the minx and his Safanku was Imu or someone like Imu, someone close to Imu and this person betrayed Joy Boy and doomed the minks as a race and this was all due to Zunesha's crime that cost the minks everything. And so as a punishment, Zunesha must carry what is left of the minks home, which was the ancient city, to protect the minks and their land. He also makes a connection to the recently revealed full name of Professor Clover, Cleave de Clover or Krau de Clover, depending on which translation you go with. And it actually just so happens there is a city in Zo called Kurao City, much like Kurao di Clover. So all of these could be taken to highlight the close relationship between the Minx, Joy Boy, the Ds, and all those mysteries. I would actually extend this further, however, and I would say that the relationship between the Minx and the Joy Boy is only one meaningful relationship. I'd like to think that the whole point of Joy Boy was that he found multiple friendships, particularly with all the marginalized races in the world of One Piece, all those races that face discrimination and prejudice, and that's why we have the Shandorians, the Minks, and the Fishmen, all of whom who have a poneglyph like we established earlier. And so in that way, Gaimon's relationship to the island animals isn't just reflective of the relationship between Joy Boy and the Minks, but all the unique races we have in the world. Anyways, the theory goes on to say, just as Odin gathered his crew and was betrayed and sentenced to die, Odin's ancestor Joy Boy experienced something very similar. In the end, Odin sacrificed himself so his friends could escape where they ran off into the future to one day return, but I do think I have to play devil's advocate at this point, and I have to mention that there are a couple other non-D clan members throughout the story who we've seen also die with a smile on their face. You know, on the top of my head, we have Dr. Hero Look and we have Belmare, and none of these characters have been confirmed to be D clan members. And to be fair, they didn't die with that classic D smile, but then again, Ace also didn't smile with a D clan smile. He had that, he just had a simple smile. Anyways, maybe this will mean that all of those characters will also be D clan members because who knows, we are seeing more and more members of the D clan as the series goes on. But going back to the theory, Mr. Bushido says that Joy Boy was a man from Wano and his name was Kozuki Bink like Bink Sake. Not Kazuki D Bink, because according to the theory, the D was taken up after Joy Boy died, similar to how the people of Wano went around with the moon tattoos on their ankles to identify one another. The D was taken by the followers of Joy Boy. It was only adopted after Joy Boy died. But still, the idea is Joy Boy was a Kazuki Kazuki Binks, and that's the end of the theory. Now, firstly, I want to say another major props. Thank you, huge thank you to Mr. Bushido for sharing this great theory, because overall, I do think it is quite very compelling. Now, there were some points that I didn't agree with 100%, which I have noted throughout this discussion, but overall, in general, I definitely see where he's coming from. I do have potentially one important question or potentially counter argument that being that joy boy is especially known in reference to nika because he is, because it has been essentially confirmed that joy boy of the void century also had the nika devil fruit that luffy currently has and we know that nika is closely intertwined with the sun because of the nika sun god and in this way joy boy should be emblematic of the sun whereas in the case of the kuzuki clan in the case of wano really they're all closely tied to the moon rather than the sun. We mentioned how all of those great families apart from Kurozumi have the moon in their names. Although, actually, you know what? I actually just came up with a counter to my counter. Joy Boy being the representative of the sun, whereas his original family name, 
the Kozuki being emblematic of the moon could actually make perfect sense because Joy Boy would then be both the moon and the sun. That would mean that Joy Boy would actually be the light. He's the light of what is an otherwise very dark world. Actually, I quite like that a lot. Okay, you know what? Okay, scratch what I was saying earlier. I like that a lot. Joy Boy is both the moon and the sun. He is the light of the world. And there you have it. Joy Boy was from Wano, a member of the Kazuki family, Kazuki Binks. So that's the theory. What do you think? Let me know what you think of this idea by leaving a comment below. Like I said, if you'd like to read it for yourself, you can join our Discord server. Links down below. Again, a huge thank you to Mr. Bushido for sharing this idea. If you have some theories of your own, then let me know because I love reading other people's thoughts. You can let me know in the comments. You can join the server and leave a comment there. And here's where Gaimon re-enters the story. By way of a cover story, we eventually find out that Gaimon meets Safunkel, a new inhabitant, a female inhabitant who has similar to Gaimon becomes stuck in this wooden barrel and Odin died with an iconic smile. I really like this connection about how Odin despite not being part of the D clan himself or as far as we know it's always been a point of interest that Odin similarly died with this great big D smile on his face and so instead of this just symbolically representing that Odin had a very similar will to those other legendary D characters like Goldie Roger. I quite like the idea that this may have actually been a hint that Odin is in fact related to Joy Boy, not just because the Kazuki were allies, but because Odin by blood is related to Joy Boy. Anyways, Thank you for listening to another one of our great discussions. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. You can also like and share the video. Please do share the video so that Mr. Bushido's theory becomes much more widely known. Thank you to our Patreon and channel members for supporting the channel. This is Joy Girl, and I'll see you again soon.